Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for sending your son, Lord, who died for our sins, who washed us clean, if we choose to accept it, Lord, who make us new, who will send a Holy Spirit, Lord, a comforter. We need a comforter today, Lord. We need a comforter every day. If we, if we don't need a comforter, then we don't, we're not in the right mind, Lord. If we're relying on our own strength, and that's no good, Lord. We need you every day, every minute, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you supply our every need, that you are our strength, our power, our everything, our all in all, Lord. Make that be true, Lord, in our lives. We can't, I don't want to just say it, Lord. I want to be. You need to be, Lord, our all in all. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you care and take care of us, Lord, in your compassion and your love. Amen. I'd actually wanted to speak today on um, Ezekiel 37, that's what I was going to talk on, but I don't know where I got lost on track, but I was looking at something and it led me to Psalm 91. Um, I think the reason why I wanted to share on it this morning, what the Lord put on my heart, because I had to look it up quite a bit, because it's a bit... Well, I thought it was a bit of a strange psalm. It was a bit not obvious who he's talking to all the time in the psalm. It changes. You'll see what I mean when we read it. And it was a bit like, it was a bit like a moment when I remember Andy was, we were going, she was making a cake and we'd gone to this cake shop in Leicester. It's off Narber Road. It used to be there. It's not there now, I don't think. A craft shop, you know, that sold all the icing and things. And while she was in the shop, it always took a long time because she was buying so many craft things like you see little silly rolling pins and stuff and she was buying it all. And I was sat in the car and I'd got my old little Bible I'd bought in Chroma when I'd not long been baptised. And I remember looking up Isaiah. I was just reading it and I read about it. It pleased him to bruise him. And it shocked me. I had to think like it can't, it can't mean what I think it means. It can't mean it pleased him to hurt his son. I, I thought I must have it wrong. So later on I'd looked it up and that's exactly what it meant. And it, 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 it affected me a lot because I thought, wow, <laughs> I, I'm not understanding God here very well, you know. Because he's actually putting it pleased him because he was seeing the bigger picture. Lord, that's what we need to see. This massive picture that's right in front of us that we don't see. I'm going to try and not talk about me too much. I'm, I, I, I actually was going to come, before I, I got to Ezekiel, I was going to come and just talk about me today. Now that sounds terribly bad, but I was going to apologize to all you, my family in this church, for how I've been over the years. But I'm not doing that, because you don't, re well you might want to hear about it, but I don't think you do really. You don't want to hear about my wretchedness. But anyway, so I'd kind of told myself I wouldn't share again. But God, God ain't letting that happen. But I, uh, I had an idea. I thought, well, I'll just share at the Evington home because they, are, well, I won't say anything. But yeah, the, I'll just share there and I'll leave it. But no, that's not the way it's going to be. So Psalm 91. So let me start off. Look, we've got, um, no, we'll just say something that, you know, when I share and say things, if I say it wrong or you don't, I'm not apologizing like uh, that I'm a muppet and I've got no clue. I don't mean that. But my brain sometimes is running ahead of myself. It's just one of my things that's a failure in me. Um, I think things and don't always say it, or, or, or the opposite way around. I don't think things and say it. But anyway, you know what I mean. So, in Psalm 91, it starts off by saying, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, In, in Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. This is the same sort of statement. As in, walketh, dwelleth, liveth. These words are all in the Bible. It's got nothing to do with where you live. If you live on a poor estate or a rich estate, 
It's got nothing to do with that. It's the position of your heart and your life in Christ and in God. Blessed is the man, happy. The word's translated as happy and joyful. Blessed is that man that does not live in the world, that comes out of it and lives in God. He's blessed. Not everybody else. Don't twist Bible scripture. He's talking to you, children of God, people that love the Lord, that weep to the Lord, that care deeply. Not something that's been put, not something that's in us. God's put it in us. It's His Holy Spirit. It's, his, it's Him speaking to us. When we call to the deep, He sent that prayer. He sent that longing in your heart. If you have a longing to be holy, to want that, that you, in your secret place, in your heart, you want to love the Lord with all your heart, man, run after that. That is God. That is not of you. We don't have that. Otherwise, the world would be a beautiful place. If people were born with this desire to just be so loving and caring and no, no selfishness in us, well, it wouldn't have gone wrong in the garden, would it? We, that man was near perfect in the garden, <laughs> and he couldn't do it. So, yeah. So, look, he that dwelleth in the secret place. Now, this is not like some people want to create a world for themselves and live, you know. I'm not going to say his name, but there's certain billionaires in the world that are trying to buy land and whole islands and whole areas of the world so they can go and start their own world and away from everybody else. Not talking about that. It's a secret place that you have. It could be a prayer room. It could be a place you walk. M mine, for many years, and still is actually, is the A6, which is bizarre. When I was depressed, I used to leave my home in Syston, drive to see my grandma, and as soon as I turned on, on the top of Burstall and went down the A6, it used to just flood me about the state of my life and the condition I was in. And then when I had a son years later, and I, it had dawned on me the almightiness of bringing a kid up, I was on the A6 in my little old car, and the Lord spoke to me. And it's, it happens now when I go into work sometimes. I'll drop Billy off, and then as I drive home and I come down on the A6, it's almost like you, get, you hit one ash roundabout and then you just mosey along and then you can think about things. When you're going through little windy bends and all that, your mind's occupied, or it should be. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and th so that was one of my secret places. But this secret place is the place you go. We just sang about it all in these storms. People hate storms. You know, I wanted to go out and pray the other week and it was raining out. I had to go and fetch out my like, raincoat and everything just to go for a walk. I didn't really want to do it, but I was like, well, I've got a choice. I either go for a walk and pray with the Lord, or I sit in the house. So I went out. So this secret place, a place that it's not what the world sees. It's not Christian by name. It's Christian by heart. It's not because you belong to a church. It's because you belong to God. It's that secret that no one knows about. Even Andy don't know about it with me. Very often when we're together, I won't pray as much. Not because I don't love Andy, but when I get on my own, I just fall to pieces. Like, and I pray to God, you know. Like, sometimes she'll go to work, and I'll wave her off, and I'll kiss her goodbye, and then I walk in the house and start crying, and I cry out to God. It's nothing that she's done. It's not, oh, Lord, change. It's nothing to do with Andy. It's just that I'm now focused on God. I'm in that secret place. So the opening sentence or the opening verse is a statement of fact. And then he shifts it. David starts talking about himself. It's almost like saying, someone come up to me and say, what would you say? Of, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. David makes a bold statement that that's how he is. If you asked him, hey, that's how I am. I don't trust in anything. I just trust in the Lord. And why? Because he's been through all these storms. If you don't go through storms, we're in a, we're in a real storm now. In, all, in so many ways, this church, the, the health service, society, everything, community is falling to pieces. You go out into the community and no, a man said hello to me today 
and wish me a good day and he was loving it. It's about the first time it's happened in ages. I've walked and walked and people walk by you and it's just head down. And this man said, a joyful morning. It's a lovely day. So, you know, we... we I'm not even talking about a spiritual sense. I'm talking about in a, in a worldly sense, it's falling to pieces. Surely he shall deliver thee. Now he's changed it, you see. He's talking about God's people. Wait there, he's done it for me. When I was in a storm, I know who showed up. I know who won the battle. I know who washed me clean. I know who got me to walk away from sin. Surely he's going to do that. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee, you again, with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Listen, this is talking to people in a storm in a problem in their life. It could be anything. It could be something you struggle with. It could be sin. If you tell the truth, your hand on heart really in the, in the depths of your mind will think, I can't be delivered from sin. I can't. That's a lie. Because God will do it for you. That's unbelief. It's a lie. God will deliver you. God will be your salvation. He will be your strength and your everything. When it says all and all, I mean, I'm, I'm a, not a great person at English, but I, I know what all means. You know, all and all. There's no, nothing left out. It's complete. He will make you complete. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at the noonday. See how in the Bible again, like in Deuteronomy, it, it covers the whole thing. You know when it says, it'll, it'll be with you when you go out, and when you come in, when you lie down, and when you walk. It covers everything. I won't go to it, but in Deuteronomy 8, I've listed it all. It's your whole life. Bind it round your head. See it when you wake up. See it when you would sleep. When you speak to your children, when you're at work, when you're at play, it, it covers everything. It's saying God complete in your life, in everything. So, everything that is. Not, not some little thing that you keep, that you do, that you can't invite God to. You can't just invite God into your um, praise service, worship service, and then go home and like, chill with rock and roll. It's not, it don't work. You got to, he's got to be in your all in all. He's not like, he's not like a... De we know we talk about God being in a relationship. We, we have to be careful we don't use that word as a whole word, meaning any relationship. No, no. Complete relationship, not just an acquaintance. I mean, you can have a relationship with your shopkeeper, but that's not the relationship that we talk about. I mean, it's, a, it's all about a relationship. It's all about a complete relationship, about a marriage, about a one flesh. That's what we're talking about. It's, it's him that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The protection comes to those that live in God. Hence why all the people of God, when they came out of the wilderness, and well, when they went to Babylon and they did all these things, some of them died. They weren't all under the protection. They were all labelled as God's people but they didn't all get protected. But those that walked through the fire, they did. The stories in the Bible of Noah and people like that, they are protected because they are God's people, clearly. <laughs> They're so protected, it's unbelievable. You can see that in Scripture. So, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. All of this chaos in the world at the moment, don't let it come nigh thee. Don't let it come near you. Just refuse. Walk away. Leave it. Don't debate it in your mind. Please. Satan's biggest trick ever is to get a load of people in a room and then get them in conflict with each other. It's so simple. We'll just chuck this in and chuck that in and throw that in. And you concentrate on the wrong thing. And you're not concentrating on the Lord. 
Only with thy eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Now this, listen to this one. This is massive, right? 91.9. Do you realise this is one of the greatest pieces of English ever put down on paper? If you don't believe me, just search it on the internet. Forget, you know, Shakespeare. He's all right. He don't hold a candle to this. This is classed as... Psalm 23 and Psalm 91 is classed as the greatest poetry ever written. It is absolutely beautiful. If you know God. Because it's just astounding what he says. Because, now listen to this. This is putting David, who loves the Lord with all his heart, in, he's putting you on that level, yeah, like Paul does. You know when Paul says, beloved, he's like saying, these are my brothers and sisters, they love the Lord as much as I do. Hey, I don't know why God picked me to do this, but he could pick you too. It ain't no different. Paul and me, we're no different. We'll walk the streets together when we get to heaven. What's going to be the difference? We'll all be washed clean and perfect. We're not different. Not according to God's eyes. He uses different people to do mighty things and he uses like other people to just be whatever they are on their street, in their area. But they're the same. No, they're just the same. Look, David, because thou, that's you, because you has made the Lord, which is my refuge... David's saying, you've made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, thy dwelling place. You, Christian child, have made, because, it's because of that. Because you have given your whole life to God, and it's you live in the dwelling place of God's heart. Like Paul says, not sorry, John, talks about when... when the Holy Spirit will come and live in you and we will sup with you in Revelation 3. God will sup with you, will come and sit down and have a fellowship meal with you in your heart, in your life. That's because, because you've made the Lord your refuge. It's where you live, it's where you go, it's your protection. There's a, there's a meaning behind it, isn't there, a refuge? If someone needs a refuge, they need help. Like the thing in the middle of the road. It's a busy lane. We went by a road the other day and I counted nine lanes. You, to cross them nine lanes, you're going to have to run some. You're going to have to have a good pair of glasses on and decent trainers and maybe slightly stupid to get across the nine lanes. But if there's a refuge in the middle on the way... You can stand still and you're all right. I'll wait. But to have a refuge, you've got to know you need one. If you rely on yourself and you're trying to fight things in your own life, that's not a refuge. You're just using your own strength. We've all got mega ability. You must know that. But God don't want us to use it. He wants us to rely on him. Of course we can use it. Uh, you know, we have, to, we have to choose to walk the right path. We have to use our ability in the right way. But at the end of the day, we need to rely on him. There shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Again, this is a major piece of scripture. Satan uses this. Satan quotes this to Christ, right? But you've, there's a massively important thing here. He doesn't quote the whole line. He leaves part of it out. And why does he leave it out? Because the bit that he leaves out is the bit that is talking about him. Because it says, to keep thee in all thy ways. He leaves that bit out because to keep thee in all thy ways is in God's ways. And he knows if Christ listens to Satan, he ain't listening to God. Who is God? So he's, do you know what I mean? So Satan doesn't quote that. Because that's basically, it's his clause of, his argument falls to bits. He's saying, hey, call down on your God. And he'll send angels and he'll do all this stuff to you. Yeah, if I do your ways. If I walk in your ways. If I put my life in your hands. Then he'll send angels charge over me. But if I just do as I wish and go my own way and do what I want, how can I expect that? 
I mean, if we're told in James that, you know, you shouldn't pray for things if you're up and down, so don't bother. If that's a simple thing like prayer, well, surely your life walk must count. Surely we have to walk away from the world and walk with Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Lord. They shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So another major thing, again, this is the bit that Satan quotes. He's, this piece is saying that even in our stupidity when we trip and fall, David uses this time and time again, lest I slip. I nearly slept, I nearly fell, but God got me. If it wasn't for God, I'd have fell down. I'd have been down that miry clay and I never got out of it. But God took me, even in my infancy, in my stupidity, and lifted me and brought me up. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under his feet. Because Satan can't touch us when we trust in the Lord. He can't touch you. Jesus told Peter that Satan wants to sieve you. Well, he allowed him to, but he didn't destroy him. He can't change him if Peter listens to God and does the right thing, you see. Can't change that. And then it changes again in verse 14. This is so powerful, okay? So in verse 14, and this is the bit I had to look up, because it just doesn't say anything, but it just says, because he has set his love upon me. And I was thinking, well, who has? Because he's talking about us. Don't you think that's an amazing thing in Scripture? When the Lord says that we have set our love upon him. He's, he's seeing that we, in our own struggling ways, in our own problems in life, have put our heart in God's hands. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he have known my name. This is what, again, John talks about in the New Testament, knowing the name of the Lord. You go from being a, like a, a Christian to really knowing his name, to saying you know the Lord. Because John uses it. You can't say you know the Lord, but then you don't do his ways. You're a liar. So to know the Lord. And this is what God's... This is, this is from David talking about what God is saying back. It's just unbelievable because he have set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he have known my name. So in your secret place, you can go on high. You could look like a regular man or a regular woman living in Sileby or I won't mention all the villages, but living somewhere around here. And you could look like just a general guy, a normal person, a nothing person, just a basic human being going to and doing thing. But in the secret place, God will lift you on high. People in the world won't know that. They're not going to go around going, look at Gary, he's really lifted on high. You know, no. They don't know. Even my family don't know. They don't know how God lifts me on high. I'm telling you, this morning I went for a walk and I stood there crying to the Lord. I don't know what to say, Lord. I don't know what to do. But he lifts me on high. He does. I'm not making it up. God came into my life and he showed me he's been with me all my life from a little toddler right up to now. All the time. Even when I make stupid mistakes, massive errors, share from the front personal stuff I should never talk about, say the wrong thing in the Bible, God is still with me because I set my heart on him. But I didn't choose to be like that. It wasn't like I was some superman. Oh, Gary's so full of love, he's going to make a great Christian. No, it wasn't like that. But it's a call into the deep. God said something to me. I don't know what it was. When I was depressed years ago, 
I used to go around and think things and I'd see people together in love and I'd walk by them in the park and then go and sit down and cry. And I felt a love, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I'd ever have a love. I didn't know why I was like this. I didn't have a clue. But God was calling me deeper all the time. Even when I got married, I thought I'd found that amazing love. And I had, in earthly terms, in wife terms, I found the greatest wife. But in the deep of my heart was still missing till I found the Lord. And he lifts me through it. I mean, without being offensive, I used to love coming here to see all you lot, but now I love the Lord more. I used to love coming to see you lot. I still, still like you. You're all right. But God is amazing. He's like unbelievable. He, you ain't got a clue. You, you people, me included, are not that great. I used to think we were, but not compared to God's love. It's like transcending. You tell me how you could have a friend, right, and you could go for a walk feeling low and struggling, and all of a sudden it can just lift you up. I walked up this hill this morning and I got birds singing in stereo. And I was thinking like, wow, it's just unbelievable. I'm just walking along. And the other day I went out and I was full of sadness and struggling. And I'm not kidding, it was raining. That's the day I put my raincoat on to test it out. It works, by the way. Um, Because it's a charity shop, might be Dodger. (laughs) It's his M&S though, so you know. Mmm. And I went out and I'm not not exaggerating. Because I thought, are you having a, is something, am I being... You know, like placebo effect. There was literally hundreds of birds singing everywhere. It was pouring with rain. It was windy and horrible. And I was like, ain't you guys usually like chilling somewhere out the way and then you come out with the spring weather? But they were singing like mad. And I, I, if I didn't know better, I'd say God had sent all them birds to sing to me. I can't prove that. But that minute, I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. How a little robin or a sparrow, or some other birds that I don't know them all, can sing. Some of them are so small, you know, you can't even see them. I even read in a book, it said, you won't find this bird very often. You'll hear it singing, but when you try to find it, you can't see it, because the way it sings, it like bounces off stuff, and it's not easy to detect. And it's titch. It's like a titchy little bird. It's probably a wren or something, but anyway. So because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Oh, one thing I need to clarify. When I'm talking about God's love being in me, you know, I've only got a right to say that because every man and woman that lives can have the same. Now, if I bigged up my wife and said she's the great, that's not great because some people don't get married, some people ain't got a great wife, some people ain't got a very good husband. You You can't brag on things in the world, but you can boast on God because he will love anybody that comes to him with their heart. So it's it's not a gift you can't receive. You might not get the chance in life to have a child or a wife or or a house or something, but everybody can receive the Lord. Just have to believe it. Just have to believe he can do what his word says. He shall call upon me. This is you again. This is, this is, it's hard to understand, but this is you. This is what God's saying about you. You. He, as in you, shall call upon me. Call upon God. And I will answer him. And I will with him, be, be sorry, be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, whoever you are in a Christian walk, not all of us, some of us can come to a a crossroads or a barrier that we can't get over. We want to know God more. We want assurance. We want to truly know him. And you can get to this barrier and it seems like unpassable. But listen to what it says. If you dwell with the Lord from the beginning, says at the start, them that dwell, he that dwelleth. If we dwell with the Lord, look what he tells us at the end, what David says. 
with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now long life don't mean living into your 90s. You could die in your 20s. But if you fulfilled what God wanted you to do and he took you home, that is your long life. Because you're going to eternity. You are going to have long life. But you're going to see my salvation, God's salvation. That's what we... That's what Christians want more than anything. They want assurance. They want to know God. This is why it tells us in here how we can know God. It's the most important thing. All of the other things in your life will be put right when you have full assurance. And you get full assurance by trusting in him and listening to him and walking with him. And not debating or reading books or arguing in your mind what you should or shouldn't be doing. You go to God and keep trusting in him, in the foul weather, in the good weather, in the storms, in the lovely weather, in, in the bad things in life, in the good things in life. You just keep going to God and keep talking to him and he will open up your heart. And in your heart will be revealed the truths of God. The things that Paul talked about to get full assurance. The things Paul talked about when he was saying about... Um, that you will know the height and the depth and the breadth. The, 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 the things that you can't understand will be revealed to you when you trust and believe in the Lord with all your heart. And you put the Lord to the test in a loving way. Go to him. I've told you so many times, I've been so many times to the Lord and told him what an epic failure I am, what... Um, even basic stuff, the most simple things that I haven't done and I should do. And you just go to him and he restores you and he strengthens you and then you can carry on. And let me see, just read a list to you if I've got it. Yeah, I'll just read down this. It won't take me a second, and then I'll call it a day. Experimental knowledge that accompanies salvation. It's all about experiment. It's all about real life, what you do. Sin is the greatest evil in the world. Romans 7 says it. And then, because we found it so. When we walk in life, and we realize these things, when we know in our hearts that sin is the worst thing in the world, that ruins everything, because we found it so, we can testify that it's true. Christ is the one thing necessary. Psalm 27.4, because we know it's true. Because we've lived that life. We know that everything else can pass away, but not God. We need the Lord. We need Christ. He's the one thing that we need in life. Favour of God is better than life itself, Psalm 63.3. Again, because we found it so. It's not something we say. We don't just say, oh, favouring God's better than anything, and then just carry on whatever we're doing. No, it's true. We've walked it. We know it. We don't want to ruin the grace of God on our lives. No way, not under any circumstance. I don't want to say something or do something that would stress or push God's grace away from me. Pardoning mercy alone makes a man happy, Psalm 32, 1. The fact that God is forgiving me of all my sin makes me happy. It makes me be able to go to heaven. It makes me be able to walk up to him and say, Lord, please take me as I am. Please do with me what you can. A wounded spirit is such a burden that none can bear it. We don't want to ruin, wound the spirit of God. Do you want that on your hands? I don't. Like, I mean, I've just admitted to you that I've judged you lot and said things. I didn't go into detail, but you know what I mean. That, that's bad enough, but that's only a human sin. What about if I've done that to God? And I know I have. What about if I haven't got the grace of God to let that go? I can't stand. So a wounded spirit is such a burden that I wouldn't be able to bear it. If the Lord pressed on me that he wouldn't forgive my sin, I'm done. I'm done. That's in Proverbs 18, 14. A humble and broken heart is an acceptable sacrifice to God. Far from me running away from my sadness or strugglings, I need to run to God with it because that's what God says is acceptable to him. 
Yeah, I go up to him and say, Lord, I've done really good today. I'm doing all right, mate. I know you love me and it's really great. <laughs> I'd like to be like that, but my reality is, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But God says that's the acceptable sacrifice. He says he's sick to death of burning stuff and killing animals and all that. He's not into that, but he's into a broken and contrite heart that wants to be with him. That's what he's into. The promises are, are precious pearls. In other words, what God says, what I've just read to you in Psalm 91, is promise that he'll deliver you. They're precious. There's nothing in earth that can beat that. Nothing at all. Think about, I don't watch any media, but if you watch the media and listen to it, think about all the issues in the world going on, and God's the answer. All of the count, think about all the countless hours that journalists and people that write books spend literally millions and millions of hours all over the world trying to work out issues and God's the answer that's how stupid man is but that's not his fault because he's not been enlightened it's not can't put people down they're just trying to find an answer but God is the answer and you know it Lord we thank you for today we thank you for your word Lord we thank you for your beautiful Psalms Lord it's hard to even share on them because there's so many. Sometimes you can read one and then go on to the next and it's like, it's amazing. <laughs> even the man that compiled them, the people that put them in the order they put them in, from different people that wrote them, and all commissioned through you, Lord, and your spirit, and your hand, Lord, is so beautiful. Lord, thank you so much for your love to us, Lord. Thank you so much that you know our hearts and you know our lives, Lord. We want to put them in your hands, Lord. Help us to let go, Lord. We know that we have to let go. You can't make us, Lord. There's nowhere in Scripture. But, Lord, you say you'll help us when we come to you. So let's go to God. Let's go to you, Lord. Let's go to Jesus Christ and ask him to help us with our sin, with our issue, with our uh, whatever it is, Lord. I'm not going to list them all. But let's go to you, Lord. Let's pray, Lord. Help us today, Lord. Help this church, Lord, to focus on you and you alone. Help, help this church, this family, our family, Lord, your family, to see you in all your glory today and throughout the week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.